reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. Proverbs, chapter 3, four commands for successful living. Here, the writer of Proverbs, which could be Solomon, we're not certain, but the writer is telling us that there are four strong commands that God gives us in order to live successfully for him. We're going to see that, first of all, we are to trust the Lord, and then we are to fear the Lord, we're to honor the Lord, and we're to appreciate the Lord. So follow these commands, and you'll be blessed here on earth, and hereafter in heaven, and back here on the earth in the millennium, and through the eternal state. So four commands for successful living. Trust, fear, honor, appreciate. Let's bow our hearts, shall we? Father, we thank you for the chance to explore your word, the wisdom that we find in your word. Anoint this study now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're going to look at the first 12 verses, and that's where our message is contained tonight. And we begin in the Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 1 as we read about trusting the Lord. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of man, of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths." Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he tree corrects, and just as a father the son in whom he delights. So that's our passage for tonight, and let's break it down and go back, first of all, to trust the Lord. Before we get to that, in verse 5, we have this admonition here about really not forgetting God's law. Verse 1 says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. And as we stay in God's word, the Holy Bible, he says, Length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Now, those are wonderful promises. We have all sorts of means by which we want to have length of days. We get into diet, nutrition, meditation, all kinds of faith systems, um, long life. We have all kinds of plans through nutrition and exercise and, and peace and quiet and all of that. And peace, oh, we try to have peace. We have a United Nations. We have all kinds of efforts to have peace, even in our own families. But the way to have length of days long life, peace, is by staying in God's Word. So teach your children and your grandchildren to get into God's Word. Oh, it's great to talk about Jesus, it's great to believe in Him, but you have to have nourishment. I enjoy living, but in order order to live, I have to eat. I also enjoy eating food, and perhaps you do as well, I suspect so. So I love to eat, and eating properly keeps me alive. Proper nutrition. Kelly's daughter-in-law just sent a picture of uh, some produce that they got in Florida. She and her son Anthony uh, live down in uh, Sarasota. They found a local farmer who uh, raises produce and fruit without any of the pesticides. And it's a little more expensive, but it's raised nutritionally. They deliver it to the door, and I simply texted back, best medicine there is, healthy 
food. Well, that's for her physical body. For our spiritual well-being and every aspect of our lives, it's the word. Stay in God's word. He says, bind it around your neck so that all can see it on the outside. Write it on the tablet of your heart where it's hidden on the inside. You'll find favor and high esteem in the sight of both God and man. You can't do any better than that to please God and to please fellow man. Now he tells you what you need to do. If you want to have long life, you want to have length of days, you want to have health, you want to have peace, four things. Number one, trust in the Lord. Verses one to six, I'll read them again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. To trust means to put your total trust in him, not just partial trust, not just trusting Jesus 30% or 60% or 90%. My mother used to say, radical reliance on God. I like that. Radical reliance. You're trusting in him and him alone. You're leaning on him, and if he fails you, you fall. But of course, he will never fail you, and you will never fall. So radical reliance on God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all your being. Lord, I'm trusting in you, but I'm just not 100%. That's not trust. Trust is 100%. Lord, help me to get there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. You can't do both. You can't say, I'm going to figure it out for myself and go according to my understanding and then also trust God. And God, this is what I want to do and I want you to bless it. It doesn't work that way. Lord, what is your will for my life? And then I'm going to trust you for it. And when you guide, you'll provide. But you've got to trust in him with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. How many times a day do we get involved with leaning on our own understanding? We try to figure things out for ourselves. We reason, we squirm, we fight, we struggle, we fear. But Lord, I need to be at peace and at rest and leave it with you. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. In all your ways. Not just spiritual matters, uh, but physical matters, financial matters, matters of relationship, uh, matters in every area of life. We need to ask God, what is your will and what is your way? Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He tells us where to come to God and ask him for wisdom and understanding. Uh, I'm turning now to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. And he says, as far as um, Matthew 7, beginning in verse 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And the Greek scholars, such as Sam from Greece here, tells us that that's in the continual tense, not only to ask, but to keep on asking. Keep on asking. And to knock and keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. Don't just give up. Now, we don't do it with blind faith and just, just blind reasoning, Lord, help, help, help. You have to believe and trust. And once you know it's on the altar, you leave it there. But Lord, I'm going to ask you, Daily, for daily bread. Give us this day my daily bread. And what is daily bread? It's everything you need. It's the wisdom, the understanding, uh, discernment, uh, guidance, protection, provision, everything that you need. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you, he says. He couldn't be any stronger about that. He says, everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And so we need to trust God completely. His half-brother James says much the same thing in his opening words of the little book of James toward the back of the Bible. James chapter 1, and beginning in verse 5. James, in his language, which I find to be very similar to that of Jesus, they were raised in the same household. They, they, they sound very much alike in their strong, direct approach as they discuss things. And in James chapter 1 and verse 5, he writes, If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. 
but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so ask the Lord for wisdom. Is anything too small to ask? Not at all. One time Kelly and I were doing a radio program with uh, Kelly's daughter-in-law and she was just coming back from, from college uh, session that day and we asked her to sit in with us and to contribute. We talked about wisdom, this very subject, and we asked if she had a testimony and she said, yes, my father is one who asks for wisdom for virtually everything. When he's doing a little bit of home construction, he'll take a hammer and a nail and he will ask God for wisdom to properly hit that nail where it's supposed to go. Now that seems kind of silly, doesn't it? The, something that small that you'd ask for wisdom. But if you've ever hammered a nail, how many times did you hammer it so that it went in crooked? Or worse yet, it hit your thumb? It's not the worst thing to say, wisdom, Lord, on hitting this nail. And so something like that and anything like that, ask wisdom, Lord. It doesn't take very long. I was once impressed by a man who was working on our soundboard system, and he uh, was trying to get something worked out, and he hit a, a, a wall. He couldn't figure out what to do. And so he just as naturally as a believer said, Wisdom, Lord. And then his hand touched something, and the next thing you know, it was, was working. I was very impressed by that. It takes less time to say, Wisdom, Lord, and to believe it than it does to try to figure it out. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths. Whether you're driving a nail, working on the soundboard, working on your budget, working on your marriage, working on what to eat. I remember once Pat Robertson of the 700 Club had said, when you go to the closet in the morning, ask God what to wear. Now, he was a businessman in a suit and tie, and he was saying that he had to ask God for direction because that day he might be meeting a banker and the banker might want to have a nice blue suit and a red tie from him. And a lot of us don't wear suits every day. But uh, what's the harm of saying, what should I wear? How about what should I eat? This is not my body, it's yours. What should I eat? Kelly and I are pursuing nutrition and we're, we are of the mind that the best medicine is the natural medicine of food. Food and exercise and peace. Those are the things that build your immune system. What should I eat, Lord? Here's a box of Twinkies and a, box and a nice ice cream and, and, and some cake. Now, how about that for nutrition, Lord? Does my immune system uh, benefit from that? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Wisdom, Lord, what shall I eat? So trust in the Lord with all your heart. And uh, one more comment on this. I really so admired King David in so many ways. David really was a master at asking God what to do. And he did most of the time. We know the one time he did not ask for wisdom was with Bathsheba, the next door neighbor. That's another story. Uh, and we all fail to ask the Lord at times. But he was asking the Lord when he was battling the Philistines. He was the general of his army. And uh, in verse 17 of 2 Samuel chapter 5, we find here that the great king is asking God for strategy on how to defeat the enemy. Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 17. Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The stronghold was his safe place. Now, in that time, the Philistines lived by the Mediterranean. And when we look at Israel today, it would be the southwestern portion about the Gaza Strip area. And they were very powerful, more powerful than the Israelites. And they were always a pain in their side. They had killed the previous king, Saul, and they were not to be dealt with lightly. David did not presume to lean on his own understanding, but he trusted in the Lord. Our verse tonight, trust in the Lord with all your heart, could have been written by his son Solomon or it could have been written by David or given to Solomon by David. For he knew how to trust in the Lord. 
So here are the Philistines, and he's down in the stronghold, waiting for direction from God. Verse 18, the Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. You see how he inquired of the Lord what to do? He didn't lean on his own understanding and presume he could defeat them. He said, God, do I go against them? And will I prevail? So David went to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim, or master of breakthroughs, because he broke through his enemy. And they left their idols or their images there, and David and his men carried them away. Then the Philistines went up again, once again, and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Have you noticed how the enemy doesn't give up, but comes back at you again? Now, David could have thought, well, I asked the Lord the last time how to do it, and he told me, so I think I'll lean on my own understanding and do the same thing we did the last time. That's a mistake. The last time was the last time, and this time is this time. We needed God's wisdom then. We need a fresh anointing of wisdom today. So the Philistines went up again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Therefore David inquired of the Lord. He went back to him again, and he said, this time you shall not go up, circle around behind them, and come upon them in the front of the mulberry trees. So the Lord gave him a different strategy this time. The last time was just go up with a frontal attack, and you'll prevail. This time he said, no, you're going to circle around behind them and get them in the mulberry trees. So every occasion deserves a fresh seeking of the Lord. What is your will? Well, it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. So God gave him not only the direction of how to go around and go through the trees, but wait for the sound of the mulberry trees. No doubt he would have the wind rustle the leaves, and that would be the signal of when to attack. You see, God gives specific advice and counsel. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. So he had a major, major victory. He did not lean on his own understanding, but he sought the Lord. Again, I'm thinking about Pat Robertson and counsel I learned from him over 40 years ago in one of his teachings, and that is that God will always give you counsel, and big decisions require big advice from the Lord. A major move in your life requires major direction from God. Whatever you need, God will provide. Parents and children do this every day. Parents communicate with the kids what to do and not what to do. And so God will tell you what to do. Trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. And we've often said before, when you have a problem physically, the first number you call should not be 911. We're not saying don't call 911, but call Jeremiah 33.3 where the Lord says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you do not know. So call on the Lord. He is the one who will give you guidance and direction. He may then say, call 911 and you go ahead or go to the hospital, etc. but you go to him first. Well, that's our first section, trust in the Lord. Secondly, he says, the second command is fear the Lord. Verses seven and eight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. So this idea of acknowledging your own way, going your own way, then leads to your thinking you're wise in your own eyes. But as you trust in the Lord, you realize you're not wise in your own eyes. You must trust in him and you must fear him. Now, a lot of the commentators will say, well, the word fear doesn't mean that you're afraid of God, but that you honor him. Well, if we were to translate into the Greek, the word for fear is phobos. 
And we get our word phobia. When you've got a phobia, you're not just honoring and respecting, you're afraid. And so it's just as with your parents. When you're doing wrong with your parents and you're a child, you fear. You fear the strap, you fear the timeout, you fear the consequences. When you're doing right, that fear is respect and honor. And I learned to do both with my family, and I know you did with yours as well. When I was good, I honored my parents and obeyed them. When I was bad, and I knew the consequences were coming, I was afraid. So we are to fear the Lord. We're to honor him by departing from evil. When you honor the Lord and depart from evil, it's going to be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. You're going to feel better. You're going to be at peace. You're going to be well. You're not going to be sick. You're going to live longer. Oh yeah, God says that in the Ten Commandments. Honor your mother and father that your days may be long upon this earth. If you dishonor your parents, you'll learn to dishonor authority. Dishonor God might end up in jail. Learn to be obedient. So you fear the Lord. Psalm 115 gives us a little insight into fearing the Lord. Psalm 115, verse 9 through 11, talks about the trustworthiness of God. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, he was the priest, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. That's written in one of the songs of the hymn book of Israel, Psalm 115. Trust in the Lord. He's your help. He's your shield. He will aid you. That's your help. He'll shield you. He'll protect you. He'll protect you from attacks of the enemy and other people that should not be coming your way. Trust in him. He's your help and your shield. The third thing we have is honor the Lord. These are the commands of six for successful living. Putting God first. Verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. He's talking about our giving. Putting him first. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Whatever you give, give the first to God. Now he can talk about things other than money, our time, the first part of that day, best to give it to God in prayer and thanksgiving and praise. Decisions, we already talked about that, give him first fruits of saying, wisdom Lord, how do I handle this? Putting him first in every area. You've got a problem about something, ask him how to handle it. But he's talking mainly about your possessions because that becomes your best indication of your faith and that is your pocketbook, your wallet, your checkbook. Jesus said, you've got to make a decision. Are you going to serve God or serve mammon? Mammon was that Philistine god of wealth. And so he says, the best way to honor me is to give me the first. Give me the first. And so we look to the idea of the first fruits Israel, when they came into the land, was to give the first fruits of the harvest in the springtime to the Lord. They did a wave offering as they took that barley, I think it was, and they waved it to the Lord and said, Thank you, Lord. This is the first fruits of what we expect to be an abundant harvest in the fall. We give you the first fruits. And we learn from Scripture how to give God the first tenth of our income, the first gross tenth of our income. We saw that on Sunday, and again, we're going to look at it just briefly. In Genesis chapter 14, we have an example of that. In Genesis 14, we see our man of faith, Abraham, coming back from a great war. He had just defeated four kings, and he had a lot of booty. He had an awful lot of possessions, money, armament, etc. In Genesis 14, he's heading back home, and he comes through the city of Salem, which we know today as Jerusalem, Salem, Shalom, peace. He's coming through that, and he meets Melchizedek. Chapter 14 of Genesis, verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Sound familiar? That's your first communion. He was the priest of God Most High. He's the king of Salem. He's the priest 
of God Most High. No king, no priest in the Old Testament could have both offices. You were either a king or a priest if you were either one of them, but no one was both. And this Melchizedek is both. He blessed Abram and he said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe or a tenth of all. We see that his grandson did the same thing. Jacob made a promise to God that if you will keep me safe, as he was leaving the land of Israel, fleeing from his brother Esau, he said, bring me back safely and I will give you a tithe or a tenth of all. So he taught, he had taught him how to tithe. And uh, it goes on in Malachi to give us the promises of tithing, giving God the first tenth. Now Israel was not being obedient. They did not listen to God and they were suffering. And God said, when I don't get the first tenth, you are robbing me. That's a serious accusation. When you are not bringing the first tenth to me, he says, you're robbing me. And in Malachi chapter 3, he tells us in these closing words of the Old Testament, the consequences of robbing God and the consequences of honoring God. Malachi 3 verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. The tithe is the first 10%. Offering is over and above that. He wants the tenth returned to him. It belongs to him. And he also wants the offerings as he leads. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And now he makes the most incredible, glorious promises. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this. The only time he says, try me, test me. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. You, you will, he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Then we look at Jesus in Matthew he is watching the treasury. He sees the woman with the widow's might giving everything that she has. Jesus is watching the offerings today. And we find in Hebrews chapter 7 that this Melchizedek is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Chapter 7 of Hebrews, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like, and here it is, the son of God. He remains a priest continually. And here it is, verse 8, here mortal men receive tithes, pastors, evangelists, we pass the plate, we receive the tithes here, but there in heaven, he, Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. So give him the first, honor the Lord, first in everything, from decision making to the part of your day of getting up in the morning and worshiping him, that first tenth of that paycheck that you get, just give him the first part of all, honor him. And then finally, the fourth command is to appreciate the Lord. Back to our text, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. We need to appreciate the Lord. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. So we need to appreciate the Lord in what he's trying to do. He's trying to chasten us, correct us, but we're trying to resist him. We don't like correction. You see that with little children. that They, they don't want to be corrected. Even dogs are, uh, and cats, they, they get uh, their own stubborn will. They don't want to be corrected. And uh, we have to realize that when God is chastening us, it's for our good. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. 
For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. So we have an example of this in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel in chapter 15 talks about somebody who resisted the Lord and the terrible consequence that it brought about in his life. And that person was King Saul, the first king of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23 gives us a very stinging rebuke. He did not obey the Lord. He did not have a heart for the Lord. And God had to remove him from office. And now as he comes and he has been disobedient, he has not killed all of the Amalekites. He left the king Agag alive when he was commissioned to kill him. And as he came back, Samuel had to say to him, as the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. So you can bring your animals, you can bring your tithe, you can bring whatever, but if you are not obedient to the Lord, there'll be consequences. And here is the verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. And so from that moment on, God had to turn from Saul as the king of Israel to get David prepared to take his place. And think about rebellion in our own lives. That sweet little innocent child, that little three-year-old grandchild, that five-year-old child, what have you, running around, being willful, being disobedient, uh, that is rebellion. That is rebellion, and it needs to be corrected. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, divination, which is going to demonic spirits, going to Satan for direction. Well, where does rebellion come from? It comes from Satan. And so this is a strong rebuke. So the next time you see that little child running around, it doesn't mean you're going to become abusive, but it means you've got a problem. You better deal with it. Don't just leave it for somebody else to take care of. Because when the parents leave it to someone else to take care of, and the teachers in school leave it to someone else to take care of, someone's going to take care of it. And it might be the correction officer who slams the gate shut for the rest of their lives in solitary confinement. Don't mess around with rebellion. It will really definitely hurt you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and he also has rejected you from being king. So even as a child, and even as we as adults, are rebellious and reject the Lord and his counsel, we're going to reap the consequences of it. So rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So those are the four commands for successful living and uh, easy to understand. And by the grace of God, we'll have to then trust him to implement those in our lives. Trust in him in all areas. Don't lean on your own understanding. Fear him and depart from evil. Honor him with the first fruits of all that you have in your life. And then appreciate him even when he has to chasten us. Follow these commands and be blessed here and hereafter. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this chance to have studied your word, and we ask you to help us to take these principles and uh, keep them in our hearts. And Lord, these are not easy to implement in daily life, but by your grace and strength and counsel and wisdom, may we be able to follow each one. Help us to trust you, fear you, honor you, and appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. This moment